right. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Okay, so tonight we are talking about, I am talking about, <laughs> Secrets of the Deep. Ooh. It is February 17th, 1977. Three scientists are on their way to the bottom of the ocean floor. Pilot Jack Donnelly, geochemist Jack Corliss, and geologist Jerry Van Andel are all squished inside Alvin. Science on ships, ah, it's a submersible. Um, it counts, that's fine. Uh, quick note, this is not a picture of any of the people I just mentioned. This is a picture of Kathy Crane, who, speaking of women scientists, gets usually no credit in the story, so she is here. That is the only photo I have of her. Appreciate, back to the moment. Okay, they are in Alvin, a submersible. It is going down to the ocean floor, which is over a mile and a half from the surface, and they're going to the bottom of the Galapagos Rift. Were there a single crack in the Alvin, which would affect the pressurized cabin, everyone would die instantly. They don't, spoilers. Outside the windows, they are immersed in just pitch black darkness, except for the bioluminescence of all of these animals that they are going down around. Alvin reaches the seafloor, supposedly this sort of barren, empty wasteland. Now, years of work have gone into this moment because these geologists and their team on the ship at the surface are about to become the first to prove the hypothesis of spreading plate tectonics. Also, these three people in Alvin in the submersible are about to become the first humans to lay their eyes on a hydrothermal vent. It's really exciting. All right. So, they pilot towards the spot where warm water temperatures were measured by the ship the day before. There's gonna be so much ships, guys. You just, <laughs> so much. Either get it out of your system or just like go with me, okay? So, aboard the ship above, uh, yes, the geographers, geologists and oceanographers, including Bob Ballard, Kathy Crane, and Dick Von Herzl, they are eagerly awaiting the descriptions on radio of what the crew is seeing below. Now, Jack Corliss gets on the radio to announce that they've arrived at the site. He looks out the window and says... They're abalone shells. They're shells. And everyone says... Huh? <laughs> now, okay, the underwater camera had taken this weird picture of these weird clamshells the day before, but as Alvin goes closer to the vents, they find more clams. They're actually clams. He's a geologist, not a biologist. Give him a break, okay? <laughs> They're clams. And Jack says, quote, isn't the deep ocean supposed to be like a desert? Yes, <laughs> say the people on the radio. To which he replies, quote, well, there are all these animals down here. Little do they know that they have just made like a shattering, incredible discovery, just not in their field. <laughs> Science. Because the thing is, light down, like life down there makes no sense. There is no light to support an ecosystem. And while it is absolutely hyperbolic to say that it's similar to there being a group of little green men down there, it is not that hyperbolic, okay? Not to mention, we've got no light. Also, the chemicals coming out of these vents are toxic to basically all living creatures and the temperatures of some of the waters coming out of the vents are over 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Side note, it's not boiling because of all of the water pressure on top because science. Okay, so, it's so cool. Yes, <laughs> but basically literally everything we know about life up until this point in time tells us that any sort of ecosystem down there is physically impossible. But 
you know, they're clams. They're not little green men. And these guys are geologists. They're not biologists. So, I mean, they just saw the first hydrothermal vent. That's huge, right? So like, they pick up a couple clam and mussel samples, and they focus on what they're doing there, which is geology. And then they get back up to the ship, and they check in with their folks at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and they're like, oh, BT dubs, we saw these clams. And the biologists on the other end are like, wait, no, 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 wait. Y'all need to go back and look some more. <laughs> and so they do. And in the coming days, see stuff like this, and this, and this, all of the existence of which is literally impossible for our understanding of how life works at the time. And they look around at each other and they go, uh, holy shit. Because <laughs> this, I mean, amazing group of geologists, they're in the top of the field in geology, studying plate tectonics on a ship in the middle of the ocean with no biologists on board. This group of geologists who can't tell the difference between an abalone and a clam. have accidentally just made the most important biological discovery of the latter half of the 20th century. Oops. <laughs> Let's rewind. Okay, it is February 1977. Seven and a half years ago, we put a human on the moon. Two years later, we decided to put a person on the bottom of the ocean. I do not need to tell you it does not get the same amount of press. But the level and precision and amount of like technological amazingness involved is comparable. Um, it's a really good one. It's a good one. We don't have time right now, but you can nerd with me later. Okay, so we still only have a hypothesis about plate tectonics. Again, and there are a lot of these. Okay, so nerd later. So basically, what you need to know, hypothesis about plate tectonics, chemical and temperature anomalies in the seawater have been recorded all over the world. Also, the current model of heat transfer in the ocean basically doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And all of those things combined point to the idea that there are cracks in the ocean floor where the tectonic plates are spreading, where magma from the Earth's core is coming up close to the surface. Okay, so scientists want to prove it. Where is this most likely to happen? It's going to happen on ocean ridges. So scientists from Woods Hole decide that they're going to go look at the Galapagos Rift. And they get some top secret maps of the seafloor from the Navy, which is like an amazing story. <laughs> no one was supposed to know the Navy even had these. Anyway, somehow they do this. And basically they set out on a series of expeditions to go and try to hone in on a specific place where they're going to go look to basically preserve resources, right? We've got to dial in on a spot and then we'll go and send the ship with the human submersible down. Okay, so having honed, in 76, they go out and basically take a ship that has a bunch of underwater cameras. I know, keep giving it to me. Okay. To try to nail down a spot. Side note, and this is one of my favorite things. Okay. So one of the things the camera captures is a bunch of clam shells on the bottom. There also happens to be an empty beer can down there. And so basically the scientists are like, eh, there was a boat. They had a clam bake. It was a party. They threw everything over the boat. And that is like more plausible than this being the remnants of an ecosystem. So they name this site Clam Bake. All right. Now, having gathered enough data to have a precise idea of where they're going to go search for vents, they put together the 77 expedition to bring a human submersible down, go take a look. A biologist is technically invited, but like, why would you go to a geologist expedition about plate tectonics? Like, the bottom of the ocean is a desert. Clam yeah, clam bakes, but that's only on the ship. <laughs> so. I think we should just take a second to review why the bottom of the ocean is a desert. And um, just warning, I'm going to do this with some very highly technical scientific diagrams. 
Okay. <laughs> Up until February 17th, 1977, our understanding goes as follows. All major ecosystems are photosynthesis-based. We eat meat, we eat plants, our meat also eats plants. Even Ron Swanson ultimately depends on plants. As above, so below, science. Bigger animals eat little fishies, little fishies eat plants. Now, the few deep sea creatures we've seen up until that point eat organic material that comes down from above, but there's not nearly enough of that to actually support like a full ecosystem down below. Okay, same with bacteria. They either eat organic material or some produce their own food the same way <laughs> that plants do, aka via photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, plants use the energy of the sun to power chemical reactions using water from the soil and carbon dioxide from the air to create their food, which is also uh, usually in the form of glucose. Science. Science! Now, bacteria that photosynthesize use the energy of the sun to basically do the same thing. So, how does it work if there's no sun? That's a really good question. So, chemosynthesis was hypothesized in the late 1800s, basically by a scientist who was looking at microbes that live down in mines. And so, by the 1970s, we know it's generally accepted that chemosynthesis is a thing that exists, but it's basically in a very few, like, spots, you know, like some microbes down in mines. There's obviously no, like, jungly garden growing in the bottom of a mine, right? You know, this is just a few isolated spots. But, lo and behold, that is what is powering this ecosystem. And chemosynthesis works as follows. Microbes basically take compounds like hydrogen sulfide and oxidize them. Then they use the energy from that chemical reaction instead of the sun's energy to, with oxygen, I know, I don't know if you can actually see the icon of the oxygen there, but like it made me really happy, okay. Uh, take oxygen and carbon dioxide in the water and use that to create their food. Now, while there's one equation for photosynthesis, there are a number for chemosynthesis because there are a number of, like a multitude of different compounds in addition to hydrogen sulfide that can power this. Hydrogen sulfide and methane are the two primary ones around vents. <laughs> But this being the basis of an ecosystem, I mean, is really some out there alien stuff. Again, nerd me later, okay. So just as a quick, you know, sort of example of this, a personal example, my grandfather, Ken Temple, was a microbiologist who spent a lot of his career studying extremophiles in Yellowstone. And even the most nerdy among you have never heard of him because his groundbreaking discoveries on how high temperatures can be for microbes and bacteria to live were never published. He tried, and despite the support of universities, no journal would print it because they couldn't be replicated in the lab. And so while his work was a small part of a large foundation upon which a Nobel Prize was uh, eventually given, he was never widely credited for his work with extremophiles because despite appeals, he could not get it published. Which brings us back to 1977 and the fact that this is all just bananas. The geologists are finding full ecosystems of tube worms, which aren't actually worms, but are amazing because they have no mouth and no anus and no digestive system and are totally alien to anything anyone's ever seen, including the biologists that are definitely not there. So they find out later that these worms are actually in a symbiotic relationship with chemosynthesis-driven bacteria. The chemosynthesis process is actually happening in three places. So it's happening with the extremophiles in the vents, and then there are bacterial mats outside the vents where a lot of the other organisms are grazing and basing their life system upon. But then it's also happening inside these symbiotic organisms, which is amazing, and we could talk more about at another time. But that time is not now. So, 
By talking, I know, by talking to biologists on shore, these geologists quickly realize that the geological discovery they've made is, you know, legitimately awesome, but the biological one's a lot bigger. And they later described it as if, you know, if they'd been on a ship discovering the new world, it wouldn't have been more exciting because they were actually discovering a new world. <laughs> They start setting dive records in Alvin, like diving every day, which is not a thing that happens. And literally every time they go down, they're seeing new species like this and this and this, which is actually a worm and looks like an unhinged Muppet. <laughs> and granted, this is the view under an electron microscope. But like, can we just please take a moment to appreciate the fact that this exists? Near hydrothermal vents, this is another picture of the same kind of worm. This one, too. <laughs> and I just, I know my life is made better by the existence of this Muppet worm, and sometimes by the internet. <laughs> Okay, so these geologists are finding all this incredible life and some tension arises because they're not there for that, right? These people have spent their careers working really hard to get this extremely rare and expensive ship time and already have a full field schedule planned, but like they can't not. And so they basically all become amateur biologists on board. <laughs> This is Jack Corliss holding one of those giant clams he thought was an abalone. And like, okay, I know I've harped on this a lot, but we gotta remember these are geologists making this incredible biological discovery. They name one site oyster bed and find out later they're not oysters, they're mussels, because they don't know. They also haven't brought supplies to collect or preserve biological specimens. There is a very small supply of formaldehyde on board. Luckily, there is a larger supply. <laughs> a very strong Russian vodka that did the trick. True story. <laughs> Okay, so a couple of years later, Bob Ballard, the geologist, goes back to the site with a ship full of actual biologists and a National Geographic documentary crew. I will post the link to that on something weird because it is fabulous. The biologists are just so giddy. It's so wonderful. But there's this amazing moment when Bob decides to take a minute for geology and like, we're on this bio biology cruise, I'm gonna just go take a minute for geology, go down in Alvin and look to see the distribution of hydrothermal vents. So he goes down to look for other vent sites and finds this. This is the photo they take out the window, which I know is kind of hard to tell for scale. So, um, yeah, KD is 6'9". Uh, these things are up to 10 feet tall. This picture of Dr. Ballard and that other person, they are holding one tube worm. So, yeah. I know. So Bob sees the site and it's like the one time they're out for geology. <laughs> and you hear him say in the film, he's just like, hell, I wish we had a biologist here to see all this. <laughs> so for the geologists aboard that 1977 mission, it permanently changed many of them. Our favorite guy, geochemist Jack Corliss, basically started wrapping up his geochemistry career right there because on that ship in 1977, he had this crazy idea. Up until that moment, everyone thought that life on Earth originated in a shallow pool on the surface, but what if it was the opposite and life first developed around these vents far away from the madness of meteor strikes and all the other stuff that was happening on the surface? Jack has since spent the rest of his career studying the origins of life. He was actually the director of research for Biosphere 2 in Arizona. And while there's no accepted, like, accepted theory because we can't technically really prove it, his theory that he came up with on that boat in 1977 about life originating down there instead of up there is now a widely held one. 
Bob Ballard went on to dedicate his life to ocean exploration. He discovered the Titanic. He created the EV Nautilus, which is a ship specifically for ocean exploration that you can follow along with or directly interact with. Um, this is me talking a couple of years ago to some of the scientists when they went back to the Galapagos Rift to that actually ex um, specific site where they first found things in 1977. Turns out the site had died. They actually only have a lifetime of about 10 years, but then will pop up again nearby. Um, also, like I have to have a shout out to David Perlman, who is the biggest badass in science journalism. He was the only journalist on that ship, and it like jet rocket launched an already successful career. He is from the San Francisco Chronicle. He just retired two years ago at the very young age of 98. He is still emeritus. He is amazing. And it changed us, you know, permanently sort of as a society too, because it's believed that these chemosynthesis-based ecosystems may be the type of life that we'd find on other planets, especially as there are a number of methane plumes on Mars. As for our own planet, today only 5% of the world's oceans have been explored. And people are discovering new species all the time. Here are four new ones that were discovered two months ago on the Falcor's cruise. Uh, and we've now got three ships in the US that do specific ocean exploration, ocean exploration versus specific research-driven uh, trips. And those are the NOAA's Oceanus Explorer, Bob Ballard's EV Nautilus, and the Schmidt Ocean Institute's Falcor, which sails with a Falcor Harvey aboard. <laughs> So there's, there's so much that I love about this story, but my, my favorite part really is like this joy of discovery for people who are totally unrelated to the field, for amateurs, for all the scientists who never got credit but kept going. And there's a lot of personal resonance with me about that joy of curiosity and discovery regardless of your background, because I have no academic science background, but have been learning in the field and on the job and have been doing environmental education, environmental science education for over 11 years and counting. And I do credit a lot of that to this idea that like any of us can sort of discover and learn anything. And especially I credit a lot of that to my gramps. Um, he honestly was never bitter about never getting proper recognition for his discoveries in Yellowstone, he just loved the work, like getting to go hiking to field sites for a living and making amazing discoveries. Um, he had a really wonderful life. And so it is in honor of him tonight that I would like to make a toast. To the joy of discovery just for discovery's sake and to those in our lives who inspire it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you all what I just said to Kate, which was, thank you so much. Um, what you all don't know is that that incredible Pac-Man sequence she did by hand. There, I can't even begin to tell you. There were, there were 120 slides total in her talk. I mean, that's mind-boggling, and probably like 95% of them are Pac-Man. Uh, <laughs> She, she texted me uh, uh, last week and, and, and said, I'm really sorry, I'm going to be a little late. I'm doing Pac-Man slides. And I, I was like, what, what, what am I supposed to say to that? Um, I, you, bet I, you better believe I said yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, where has Harvey been? Harvey has obviously been on a ship. Uh, we're building an Adventure Harvey map. Uh, you can post it on social media, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Hashtag your pictures, Adventure Harvey, so we can find them. Share them in the Something Weird group on Facebook. Uh, you can run over during the break to uh, the merch table, get your own uh, Wolpertinger. We've got a few, it looks like two or three of the gold ones left. They're running out fast, and we've got some standard edition uh, Adventure Harveys as well. Uh... Let me see here. Should I, should I go break or should I go break?
You want to do your thing? Sure. Yeah. All right, and a word from uh, our silent auction. He's actually going to speak, though. He won't be silent. <laughs> Hello again. We still have our silent auction going just for about 15 more minutes during the intermission. You can get beer specifically ma made to your instruction. It is barely at $3 a bottle right now. You can get all... A very much bargain, which I might buy myself if nobody outbids me. <laughs> Folks, we have Casey Selden, Kate O'Donnell, Miles Traer, Casey Kraut, Lynn Lawn, and Daniel Baskin to thank. You've just got 15 more minutes to outbid the people surrounding you, get the credit, take home something special, donate to a worthy cause. Enjoy the break. Thank you, Colin, for that message. All right. Uh, so before you get up to get your booze, uh, just so you can see where Harvey's been all over the world, uh, most recently he's been in an artist studio in Middletown, California. There's no word on whether these wings worked for Harvey, but we're, we're waiting to find out. Uh, at the Palazzo Poggi in Bologna, pondering our pesky human mortality. In Antarctica, pondering those pesky penguins, and I can tell you right now, I will never ever get tired of seeing Harvey in Antarctica. That's so fucking badass. I just, I love that. And uh, here's a Harvey in the clutches of giant beasties at the Ulundanu Temple on Bali. If uh, a little plush Harvey is not your thing, or you want more than just a plush Harvey, uh, we rely on your, so your support, as we've been telling you, to make this whole crazy thing happen. Um, we've got t-shirts and hoodies. Uh, usually we have custom glassware. Uh, we have buttons, stickers, and more. And there are, most importantly, of course, advanced tickets for our next salon in May. Uh, we're gonna take a short cocktail break. Everyone refresh your drinks, unload your bladders, and when we come back, we'll have three more stories. Dan Von Hoyle will tell us about who really discovered America. Mark Wilson dives into the circumstances by which a city, an entire city, can be lost and then found again. And Egan Hervella will explain how the discovery of beer changed just about everything, including your waistline. And this guy right here will be giving him away, so be sure that you fill out a raffle ticket at the merch table, and uh, hopefully you'll win. See you all in about 15 minutes. <laughs> 